What's up, Blurt Gang? It's been a long, long time. And so now we're back talking about nerd stuff. It is Blurting Wild Dad. Um, today's episode, we're going to get into this uh, this Scott Summer slander. And I'm going to drop a video kind of in defense of Cyclops as a character and how I think that he has been kind of misrepresented in the movies and in the TV show versus how he actually is in the comic books. So we're going to get into this and then I'll give you a quick update about the channel and content that's going to be coming out pretty soon. So that's what I got today on Blurting Wild Dad. Today is in defense of Scott Summers. I'll get y'all after the intro. Peace. All right, so before we get too far into the game, um, what we're doing here is I am doing a live stream and then I'm going to be recutting this live stream to make an actual YouTube video that goes on the channel and I will be incorporating some source materials, some panels and all that other stuff. But I wanted to start forming my thoughts on this entire thing. And uh, this conversation has always been kind of interesting to me because one of the things with comic book movies, uh, recent comic book movies, is you have a lot of people's interpretations about characters that have existed for 50 or 60 years. And a lot of those interpretations are based on other forms of media and not necessarily based on the comic books or I should say the more recent comic books. Um, One of the interesting things about this um, specifically like with the X-Men franchise and is how it's kind of bounced around between Marvel, uh, you know, between Marvel studios and initially it was Fox that had the rights or whatnot. Fox really took a different approach with the X-Men movie because they were trying to hold on to the rights. And so their characters, the way that they interpret that the characters are all over the place because they're trying to cram as many of them into the movie so they can retain the rights to them. And so you had established characters in the X-Men mythos and in the comic books that did not have anything to do with the comic book version. And they did it just to retain the rights of the, the characters. And so we look at you know, that first X-Men movie, you know, the Brian Singer X-Men movie, I think it was Brian Singer. And we look at how Cyclops and Wolverine and Jean Grey and Storm and all them are portrayed in the movie is really kind of a hodgepodge of ideas. And they're not really tied too much to the comic book version. So that's what I wanted to discuss here. And I'm not just going to (laughs) slander. Listen, I'm not just going to slander the X-Men movies, even though they are deserving of slander in their own right. I'm not just going to focus on those. We're going to talk about X-Men animated series. And I'm talking about the one we grew up on that showed up on Fox, not the pride of the X-Men, which was an amazing, it looked like it was an amazing idea and concept. And there's only one episode of that that ever came out. And I'm also not going with the Spider-Man and his amazing friends spinoff that featured the X-Men because uh, that, that, epi- that here's the thing, Spider-Man and his amazing friends, X-Men, Incredible Hulk, hodgepodge of stuff that was in the eighties that had me convinced that Wolverine was Australian. I thought he was Australian for a long time until I grew older and realized that Canada is a thing that exists. I knew th- theoretically Canada existed, but like, for somebody to say, no, he's actually Canadian. I don't know why they gave Wolverine an Australian accident in that cartoon. So, but we're going to talk about the version of Cyclops that is in other media that's outside of the comic books. And since I um, am a nerd <laughs> and I voraciously read the uh, comic books, I am really, really invested in the comic book portrayals or versions of characters getting their fair time in the spotlight because in the comic books, one of the things about it is um, when you're talking about comic books, you're talking about 50, 60, 70, 80 years of lore. And there's a lot of character development, a lot of back and forth that you can play into. There's a lot more nuance is as strange as it sounds. There's a lot more nuance in the comic books when it comes to characters versus the screen adaptations of characters. And so 
you know, the good version of that, a good example of that is the Nolan verse Batman, where he's presented as this broody, complex version of Batman, but the translation is shouty Batman. Shouty, shouty Batman. And that's kind of what you're left with. And so um, the comic book versions a lot of times are a bit more nuanced with specific characters. Now, there are some exceptions, and if they come to my mind, I will reference them in the stream, but there are some exceptions to that rule, as are there exceptions with every single rule that there is. So let's get into Scott Summers. Now, um, I'm not going to go through all the history, and forgive me if I don't have all the names and numbers of these specific issues or who was running that run, um, I will do a, you know, I guess I, this leaves room for me to do an actual history of the character where I talk about, you know, his identity and how he is written throughout the publication of X-Men and X-related properties. Um, I really got into X-Men during the Claremont run in the 80s and kind of stuck around for when Jim Lee came aboard and they rebooted the franchise. And I was also into X-Factor. Now, you're going to forgive me because I will uh, I will call X-Factor X-Force and you will see me do it because it's always been hard for me to verbally keep those two things di dis uh, distant, even though I know that they are. But that's my history with the character starting in the Claremont run. I can't really speak to everything from giant size X-Men all the way to, you know, the Claremont stuff. I can't really speak to that, but I can talk to the middle of that Claremont run. Um, and even through the eight, late eighties where X-Men were at the siege perilous and then they're the out back and everybody thought they were dead and all that other stuff. I was still reading the books there, even though it didn't necessarily make a ton of sense, but Claremont's run was really, it spent invested a lot of time in the kind of, I guess the word is like teen drama aspect of it. And so the relationships between the characters are explored. The development of the characters are explored. Storm's rebellious phase where she went into the punk rock thing was explored and her role as the leader and essentially usurping leadership of the X-Men and really forcing Professor X, this deservedly forcing Professor X to the sidelines and even their conflicts in uh, that first um, Marvel Civil War, or not Civil War, Secret War book are all really interesting and a lot of good character development that gets overlooked. We talking about Cyclops here. So, Scott Summers. Um, I actually love the character. And I, li I love the character because Scott Summers um, in the comic book is a lot more nuanced than he is on the TV show and on the movies. Because when you're talking about Scott Summers in the TV and show and the movies, we talk about that Jodeci cry for you. Gene, that dude, that dude, that dude is always yelling after Gene or crying after Gene or angrily glaring at Wolverine. That Scott Summers that was in the movies uh, and before the movies was on the animated series. That dude is not who we're talking about. Um, he's a different Scott Summers. And I think a lot of people have formed their opinions of him as the Scott Summers. And it goes to, it speaks to the fact that, you know, and it seems to be kind of almost a trope uh, with comic book superhero groups where you have the straight laced white bread lead the dude that's the straight laced white bread lead. Um, we've seen it with the Fantastic Four with Reed Richards. We've seen it in various incarnations of the Avengers and West Coast Avengers and New Avengers and Old Avengers and Secret Avengers and Unity Squad, all, all the different Avengers iterations with um, Captain America. And, you know, Justice League side, you got Superman is kind of the de facto leader of the Justice League, even though, you know, that they've had other people that are considered the leader of the Justice League, it always comes back to that's who people see as the lead of the Justice League. And Cyclops kind of got cast into that role of the white bread lead, the white dude that leads the team. He's straight laced. Um, the Boy Scout incarnation that Wolverine used to insult him and stuff. They always called him the Boy Scout or whatnot. 
And that kind of stuck. And so when you see him on the TV and the movies, you're getting that Boy Scout incarnation of Cyclops. And he is not likable. And he, you know, he I don't. Here's the thing. I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't um, I don't fall into that alpha beta male stuff. I know that that stuff has been debunked. Um, even the dude who wrote the original paper about the wolves and ex- exploring alpha and beta male stuff. Um, he debunked that years ago, but I will say this, the beta male Cyclops is the, the version that we see all the time and he's not presented with any depth or anything outside of the comic books. And so he is super unlikable. The entire Cyclops is the cop kind of mentality that uh, even comic book fans have adopted. And I, I think they're kind of treating him with short shrift because in the comic book version of Cyclops, when you talk about the most ride and die or ride or die um, mutant, the one that is willing to go to the wall to protect his folk, that Cyclops in the comic book, he is right there. He's right there underneath Magneto. Like, you know, when you look at Magneto, um, you know, the, the, I'm talking about the old evil Magneto, not the one that, that, that is, you know, the one that is more nuanced now, the modern Magneto. I'm talking about the old school by any means necessary. We got, we don't kill these, we don't kill these humans if we have to kind of Magneto. Um, Cyclops is kind of, you know, when, when you see him in his pure form in the comic books, he's Magneto with morals on. And so there are lines and ethical lines that Cyclops will not cross, but those ethical lines are really blurry when it comes to protecting mutants. And I will dare say that Cyclops is what people think Wolverine is in some aspects. Um, you know, the the Cyclops we're used to, the one we see in the media is this ineffectual, straight-laced guy who's always getting punked out by Wolverine, um, who can never make the hard decision and all other stuff. And that is not who he is in comic books. Um, and Cyclops will, will drop bodies uh, to protect mutants. And to be quite honest with you, in the comic books, he's been more consistent than Wolverine with the X-Men because there's been plenty of times that Wolverine has flaked on the X-Men over more quibbles about, um, you know, who the X-Men are allowed to be, who are they allowed to kill to protect themselves and stuff like that. Um, and Wolverine has a whole basket of nerve <laughs> to chastise anybody about killing folk. But he's been Wolverine's been the one that's been morally inconsistent um, with when it came to in defense of the marginalized mutant population in the X-Men universe and in the Marvel universe. And so I even remember shoot around the time of was a utopia where Wolverine and Cyclops, and you can correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but they had a big falling out because uh, Wolverine was basically saying, okay, if we're going to rebuild the Xavier school, we need to run it like a school and actually go for the education piece. And Cyclops was like, nah, man, uh, don't you see what's happening? We need to train these people, train these kids in case they got to go to war and defend themselves. So yeah, I see the entire school concept, but the world's different now. We need to focus on some self-defense stuff too. And there's an ideological split between the two based on that. And so, um, you know, when I say Cyclops is who you thought Wolverine, you know, who y'all think Wolverine is, Wolverine with, um, you know, yeah, Wolverine will, ke- will kill you if it suits his needs. Or if you harm one of his friends, but when it comes to the protection of all the mutants, um, he ain't really like that. He ain't really built like that. And even in the recent comic books, um, the by any means necessary person has been uh, Cyclops, to be quite honest with you. So I have some talking points laid out about this. I've actually spent a pretty decent amount of time with this. Um it's pretty sad. But before I get too far into it, um, I want to talk about what this stream is and what the the, the content I want to make with this is going to be. And I'm going to be super brief. And then we're getting into the meat of the matter. So I hit a quote yesterday and it said, uh, you know, the, the jack of all trades, master of none. And I took that to heart. 
for a long time when I was coming up with the concept of what I want to focus on. And I'm like, okay, I got to narrowly focus on a specific niche. There's so many different things to talk about in the world of nerdum. And, you know, I want to talk about, you know, I need to narrowly focus on talking about comic books or movies or wrestling and stuff like that. And so I saw the Jack of all trades quote in its full context and forgive me if I screw it up, but basically as Jack of all trades, master of none, but often better than the master of one. And so when I heard that, it kind of gave me a pause for a second and it put my mind at ease because I can basically talk about anything I want to talk about. And it will find an audience one way or the other. Now, that audience may shift and there may there may be days where I hop on this stream and talk about shit that you don't care about. That's fine. But um, the reality is, you know, on this thread, on this stream, on this channel. We're going to talk about comic books. We're going to talk about movies. We're going to talk about video games. We're going to talk about wrestling. We're going to talk about a cornucopia of nerd interests that intersect with things that I like. And that's how it's going to be. So I ain't going to narrowly focus just on comic books. Um, it's going to might be overwhelmingly comic books, but we're going to talk about comic book movies. We're going to talk about sci-fi movies. We're going to talk about even written sci-fi. I would love to do an entire explainer video about the dark tower and how bad they fumbled the bag with that. So that's what it is. So this is kind of the, the that's what I wanted to say. Now we're going to get into Cyclops, um, Scott Summers. Um, and I'm going to really be brief with some of the background story because a lot of y'all are on here. Y'all know his side, you know, his story or whatnot. I think we do misunderstand what his powers and abilities are, his capabilities are. So I'm going to talk about those a little bit more, but um, essentially, Cyclops is a child soldier. And a lot of people miss that aspect of his development. But when Cyclops was introduced, you know, even all the way back in the original X-Men, the first X-Men comic book, he was a kid. You know, he might have been 15, 16 years old. He was the field leader of the X-Men. And so he's presented as a straight laced, you know, Hardy Boys kind of. And I'm talking about the Hardy Boys books, not the wrestlers, but, you know, almost like this weird Johnny Quest with uh, with 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 superpowers kind of character where he's super straight laced and stuff like that. And he wasn't too terribly interesting outside of being the leader of the X-Men. And but he was a kid. And I think the people I think people are misunderstanding who he is as a character because Technically, what that means, and I know Marvel runs on a sliding time scale, and I can't remember exactly what the numbers are, but the way it is now, he's probably in his mid to late 20s right now. Um, but he started out around 15, 16 years old, if I'm not mistaken, in the comic books. And so he was raised. And I guess the only when we're introduced to him, he had been with Xavier for years before. So we don't know how long he had been with Professor X training as a soldier and as a warrior before then, I know he's one of his first students, you know, before they brought in Archangel, before they brought in um, Beast, before they brought in Iceman, um, Jean Grey was just now being introduced to the team in that comic book. And so, um, but he was, he was trained as a warrior, he was trained, as, uh, trained as a fighter. And so a lot of people look at his power set and they ignore the fact that this dude has been trained in combat from the time he was a child. And so he is extraordinarily capable um, in hand-to-hand -hand combat. He is extraordinarily capable as a tactician and in combat situations. And that gets overlooked. I know there was an X-Men comic book where um, it was some kind of training where he actually, uh, with broken ribs, beat the X-Men through his own physical abilities without really even using his powers. Um, you know, and so he is very capable as a leader. And I think the one thing that gets misunderstood about his powers is one, he don't have heat vision. That is not what that is. You don't have laser vision. That's not what that is. Um, those are concussive blasts. So it'd be like getting hit with a brick <laughs> at low power setting. Like if he's shooting it, aiming at you a low power setting, it's like getting punched with punched in the face with a brick. And he can amp that up to go from brick to freight train to meteor, but it's concussive. And one of the things that it gives him is it also gives him 
superhuman um, aim and superhuman accuracy. So as a marksman, he's he's really good. Um, thrown projectiles and stuff, he's really good. When it comes to figuring angles, um, he's phenomenal. And so that's part of it that goes into his power and skill set. And combine that with his physical abilities and his tactical abilities and his ability to lead and command people, you have a pretty effective soldier with superpowers. So and by Marvel's definition, you got a super soldier. Now, he may not have physical strength, but in the comic books, he's depicted as strong, a lot stronger than regular run-of-the-mill humans that are running around. Um, and he's been training since he's been a child, so he's in peak physical condition. And he may not have the superhuman acuity, but, hell, there's a lot of people in Marvel that don't have any real superhuman abilities, but they're considered peak um athletes or peak, you know, in peak human condition, uh, you know, I'm not going to say Captain America because depending on how it is presented, Captain America's strength is slightly superhuman. Um, but the, you know, your Hawkeyes and stuff like that. Yeah. They're able to kind of hold their own. Um, Black Widow goes back and forth. Nick Fury kind of goes back and forth, but there's plenty of regular, regular baseline humans who are incredibly deadly in the moral universe as hand to hand combatants. And Cyclops is one of them, you know, Cyclops will put a hurting on you. Um, you know, like I said, he appeared in 1963. Do you know how long 1963 was? <laughs> it's like 60 years, right? Um, and in that time frame, there's been a lot of character development from that one note kind of Boy Scout character to who he is now. And for him to even last that long um, is a testament to the fact that they've added layers and nuance to his character. So they took him from being this kind of generic, um, you know, one note character and started adding layers on where it was conflicts of leadership, conflicts of conscience, where he did, he started falling out of love with Professor X's dream because Professor X's dream doesn't make a ton of sense when you actually have viable threats trying to kill you on a day to day basis. And so um, it's interesting to see his growth as a character and the way that he ended up becoming the antithesis of what Professor X really wanted, because it wasn't, you know, and we'll get into it. The opposite of nonviolent conflict isn't the opposite of violence. Isn't nonviolent resistance. The opposite of violence is counterviolence. <laughs> and so Cyclops ended up becoming by Mr. Any means um, and it led to falling outs, uh, multiple falling outs with Professor X's view of things, because Professor X was always, we must protect the humans at all costs. And that's the bottom line. And even in the comic books recently, there's a conversation, but, and I won't go into too many spoilers, but there's a conversation between Storm and Magneto talking about Professor X. And basically he's told her, you need to keep an eye on Charles. Because he's a good man and a good man can't be in this position of power because given the choice between what's best for us as mutants and our society and our marginalized population and what's best for human beings, he will martyr us to prove that we're the better people. And it was prophetic and it's exactly what Professor X did. And so... Professor X's dream was unrealistic because it wasn't rooted in a philosophy of self-determination and self-defense. The X-Men have, the mutants have a right to defend themselves against aggression. And that aggression can come in different forms. It's not always direct for threats of violence, but they still have a right to defend themselves ideologically and physically from harm. Now, there are other groups that we can get into talking about um, and we might end up, I might end up getting this video flagged or demonetized, but the allegory of the X-Men has always been uh, about uh, various groups, civil rights, uh, various groups attaining their civil rights in the in, in, in the world, in the real world. And so you can plug a lot of different groups into what X-Men were. During the time, there was a civil rights era, and so that's who they were focusing on. And 
I know that it's kind of trite to talk about the Magneto as Malcolm X and Professor X as Martin Luther King because it's not exactly a clean comparison, but that's the concept behind it. Anyway, so Cyclops realized pretty soon on that Professor X's dream was kind of bullshit and it didn't account, it didn't allow mutants to protect themselves. And um, it was unreasonable. And Throughout the 90s, there was conflicts and clashes behind different approaches or whatnot. And it all manifested with Cyclops running off to, you know, the X-Factor investigations to really, or not X-Factor investigations, X-Factor to be more proactive in addressing uh, and protecting mutant kind. Cyclops has always been ride or die when it comes to that cost. And he's unwavering. Even now, in the comic books now, last panel I saw him, he is captured by, okay, before I get into it, this is this is heavy spoiler, so if you don't want to be spoiled, um, you might want to click off the video. Um, but even now, Cyclops has been captured by Orcus. Orcus is essentially AIM and a couple of other villainous groups that exist in Marvel, but now it's also combined with some of the mutant hate groups that exist. So, you know, you're going to have Orcus and an evil, I guess, evil version of Myra McTaggart. I think that's kind of her personality now. Um, and Nimrod, the the killer sentinel from the future, and a couple of other uh, mutant hating people, you know, Grace and Creed and all them. And basically it's aim. And so the, the, the Avengers enemies have become the X-Men's enemies and they become enemies to all mutant kind. And right now Cyclops is in the clutches of them and there he are torturing him for information and sold his eyes shut. <laughs> and he ain't giving up nothing. And he's probably not going to, um, because that's kind of who he is. That's who he's been as a character. So I want to get it. I want to get off some of these talking points here. Um, in the early days of Marvel, in the early days of Cyclops, he was kind of that white bread Boy Scout-ish person, but they changed it up pretty early on and started adding layers to his characters. Um, throughout the years, I know he was really defined, and it's hard to discuss Cyclops without discussing Wolverine and Jean and Storm, or Wolverine, Jean, Storm, and Professor X, because they're, and Emma Frost, too. The, because there's different elements of how they play into his personality and how they reflect it, reflect who he is. Because when Cyclops and Emma Frost were together, the X-Men were running fades. All <laughs> they were not to be played with. Um, you know, Gene kind of mellowed him out a little bit. In the current comics, Gene and Cyclops had a falling out because, you know, they're dealing with the brood who are basically like the xenomorph aliens of the Marvel universe. And Cyclops is like, Hey, these things are a threat. We need to kill them, man. They are a threat to us. And Gene was like, well, that's genocide, Scott. And what are they going to say about us? And he's like, Hey, I don't care, bro. <laughs> these things are going, uh, all they want to do is kill us and we need them gone. And that ended up, a, that created a rift between those two. So Cyclops is pretty consistent with a, hey, it's for, if it's for the mutants, then I'm for it. Um, and so the idea that he's been wishy-washy or, you know, straight laced and all this other stuff is really not who he is. He's made a hard ass decisions and it always typically falls on the side of, yeah, we gonna try to protect the humans to the best of our ability. But the reality is um, we about mutant kind here. We're going to protect the marginalized population of mutants in the Marvel universe. And so, like I said, he's been more rock steady consistent than even Wolverine has been. Definitely more than Professor X has been. Um, the only person that's never really changed changed colors or flipped who who he was at his core, what he believed is Magneto. And you know, him and Cyclops are have a lot of parallels, even though they've been cast as uh, antithetical to each other. Um, the '90s X Men series did a lot of damage to that character, bro. I'm be I'm be really honest with you cuz I don't even like the 90s X-Men animated uh, series version of Cyclops, bro. He is a nuisance and he's a hanger on 
And like I said, he's really ineffectual in most combat situations. Um, and he hesitates and he doesn't make the hard decisions and stuff like that. And he's always cast in conflict. And that's why I say it's hard to talk about Cyclops without talking about the Wolverine dynamic. And I got slander for Wolverine too. So that is what it is. But it's hard to discuss the dynamic between those two. Uh, it's hard to discuss Cyclops without discussing the dynamic between those two. Um, and Wolverine is cast as the bad boy, the Scott straight laced person, you know, straight laced personality. And it came out really bad in the ultimate version of the X-Men, which is uh, a comic book series that is best forgotten. If we're being quite honest, the ultimate X-Men was atrocious and they treated characters super poorly. And it was a lot of edge Lord white guy stuff that, um, you know, and I be honest with you, I, I'm be, I'm be really transparent. I'm not a huge, uh, Phil, uh, fan of Mark Miller. And so that's what it is. And a lot of my loathing of him comes from the entire ultimate saga and how, and the things that he was invested in and involved in. And, you know, some other creators who were involved with it, I am not as mad at them, but Mark Miller has had this angsty edge Lord white guys thing going on for a long time. And it, it seeped over into the ultimate version of the X-Men. So, and basically it was, um, you know, Wolverine is the is the alpha male, Cyclops is the beta male, and we're going to watch the interplay between those two, and haha, look how they're punking outside and all this other stuff. And Gene is just an object uh, of their affection. It's just really just... Ugh. Anyway, um, we're talking about the interplay between Cyclops and Wolverine. And in the animated series, they treated Cyclops like a putz. They played him all the time. And, you know, Wolverine's tough guy persona was, you know, kind of um, elevated. And really, if we're being honest, he was made the main of the X-Men franchise at that point in time. In X-Men animated series, Wolverine was made the main character of the show. There are plenty of situations where Wolverine had no business being as prevalent as he was and he was the lead uh, he was the main character and it started representing what happened in the comic books too because around that time wolverine was ubiquity he was everywhere wolverine has had more stories and more character arcs and more related side characters that you do not care about than pretty much anybody in marvel comics so many different family members and so many different other uh, victims of the, 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 you know, the weapon X or weapon programs and all. There's so many Wolverine side characters that you don't care about out there. And he ended up becoming the main character of the X-Men. And it, I, I blame the animated series for a lot of it. And then the comic book saw how important, you know, how popular Wolverine was. And he ended up becoming the X-Men. Like, like everybody else kind of became side characters to what Logan was doing. And I get it, man. Wolverine's a dope character. Like he's got foot long claws that come out of his pump that come out of his knuckles and he can cut through anything. And he has a healing factor. What? He can fight. He's a ninja. He has a sword. Like he was a dope character, but the reality was comic books. Wolverine became the main character and everybody else kind of got sidelined by, and everybody else was just kind of in the Wolverine story. And that's what they did to Cyclops in the animated series. And it carried over to them. Brian Singer movies where Cyclops in the movies was really just, ugh. He was so unimportant that they didn't even give him any screen time and that they just killed him in the third movie in the first act. Just said, Gene killed him. Why? We don't know. Dude's just gone now. Don't it's best that we forget about him. And Wolverine became the main character in that movie, too. So when we talk about the dynamics between the two, we can't talk about Cyclops without talking about Wolverine. And Wolverine's ascension to being the main character of the X-Men franchise. Um had a lot to do with how Cyclops is portrayed in other media outside the comic books and a lot of character development, a lot of things that they've done tend to get forgotten 
because Wolverine was considered the main character, and you see it in the movies, you see it in the animated series, and Cyclops is kind of a just kind of a a wuss, and he's yeah you know, ineffectual wuss who won't make the hard decisions. The Wolverine is shown as everything that Cyclops actually is in the comic books. The hardline leader who is ready to ride and die for his. That's what Cyclops in the comic books is. I cannot express, I cannot stress that to you enough. Fighting, uh, dealing with Apocalypse, dealing with Mr. Sinister, dealing with some of the heavy hitters, even dealing with Magneto. Cyclops has been the one that has had success against all of them. He's beaten all of them. He's been the one that will put his life on the line to defeat the big bad. He was the one that put his life on the line when it came to dealing with apocalypse. He's the missing piece. And so I guess the frustrating part is when we talk about Cyclops, I feel like he gets the raw, he gets kind of a raw deal because people don't really give him the kind of love that he actually deserves. And he, if they read the comic book, they will see who he is. So the key difference is, so in the comic books, Cyclops leadership is a lot more nuanced and I am the guy in charge. And I don't want to step on too many toes. Basically in the animated series and the, the movie Cyclops is kind of presented as a middle manager. And that's not how he is in the comic books. He's kind of the ineffectual middle manager who doesn't really have any power and is just out there kind of leading the X-Men uh, because Professor X can't can't really maneuver around a battlefield the way that he used to be able to. And it's a lot more complex and nuanced. In the comics, Cyclops is making the hard decisions. And in a lot of the comic books, it's in absence of Professor X. So Cyclops is the dude that's the head of the X-Men. And so... Um, it's the struggle to maintain the different personalities on the team and deal with the the, the escalating challenges that the X-Men have to face on a day-to-day basis. Um, he has a lot of depth as a character. The entire Dark Phoenix saga, the relationship with Madeline Pryor, his relationship with Emma Frost, um, all are different layers and they show different sides of who he is. And then even recently was it the thruple with him, Wolverine and Gene, where they just said F it. And we're just going to do this thing. Um, there were at their elements of, you know, more of who he's, who he is as a character in his relationships and in the movie and in the television series is cut and dry. Cyclops loves Gene and that's it. And he doesn't have anybody else. And, to be quite honest with you, it's not true in the comic books. He has multiple other relationships with people. Um, his power and epic blast. I talked about that earlier and I talked about the relationships. The source material is great that it, it, it can bring in a new audience and give depth to a character. So I encourage you, sorry, I encourage you to go back and read some of the old X-Men from the 90s and even the current ones, the way that he's being represented now. And um, my biggest, you know, my biggest gripe with the X-Men as a franchise, because I love it right now. I love how X-Men is going. I love the X books right now because they've been super interesting. Um, There's been really consequential, um, big shocking moments, lots of character development, um, layers upon layers of nuance with how they interact with threats, all these different threats coming out of the woodwork, the entire, um, all the mutants moving to Krakoa and forming their own nation state has really been interesting and everything. But the one piece that's been missing is the core X-Men group. Um, I think I would like to see a return to where it is. Gene, Bobby, um, because we can't really include Beast, because Beast is off on his own, <laughs> and Warren, and where it's that core group, and kind of seeing where they are as a group together. Um, it'd be really interesting to see what the original, the original, the ones that spent off and went to X Factor, what they're up to, and how that they would interact now that they're together again. I want to see what that looks like. But the new X Men series have been great, and it's established Scott 
as a very conflicted kind of character. But the one thing he's not conflicted on is where he stands on the protection of mutants as a marginalized population versus his, his, you know, versus a kind of desire to protect humanity, but it's not at the expense of mutants. Whereas Professor X is on the other side of the ideological divide where, yes, he wants mutants to live and coexist peacefully with human beings, but he will sacrifice mutants to save people. But the source material is a good thing. Um, you know, there's a lot more depth. And I think that's the thing that, you know, at the end of the day, that's frustrating when we talk about Cyclops. If you are basing your perceptions of him and who he is as a character on the early comics and animated series and the movies, it's not really who the character is that people are, you know, the ones that he's not, it's not who the character actually is. The one that's getting the ongoing development is the one that's been in the comic book series. And that character is starkly different. I don't think he would even like the, the, the Cyclops from the uh, television show or the movie. Just, I don't think Cyclops, the, the comic book version of Cyclops would not align with um, the movie version of Cyclops. So, um, like I said, I think that he's really gotten short shrift. And if this has been kind of interesting to you, I could get in. I could talk about my thoughts about Wolverine. I could talk about what's going on with Beast. Uh, absolutely love tuning in for a breakdown. I got you, Corey. Um, Corey wants a breakdown of the Silver Surfer. Yeah, I got you. We're going to do that. <laughs> We're going to talk about Silver Surfer, too, because... Um, yeah, I got some thoughts on the Silver Surfer, and we can go into a little bit of history, how he's been presented throughout the years. Thanks for tuning in, Corey. Um, but yeah, I like that. I, I want to do it. I want to talk about Silver Surfer. Um, I think one of the things with, that's misunderstood about Cyclops is really what his leadership actually looks like in the comic book versus what has been depicted on the shows. Because again, it's this namby pamby kind of, yeah, Wolverine, you need to stop kind of, it, uh, that's not who he is. And I think a lot of people's perception of him is based on just that. And so I encourage you, if you think Cyclops is weak or ineffectual or whatever, I encourage you to Go check out some of the comics. Read what he's currently doing. Go back about five years with the character and see that he is a, he is the character that a lot of us think Wolverine actually is, you know, in terms of um, sacrificing, in terms of leadership, in terms of being ironclad and who he is and who he's protecting. Um, he doesn't really waver. He doesn't really falter. And I remember he took out Professor X for jeopardizing the mutants. Um, I remember that was it when the Phoenix were the, the Phoenix five, you know, where Professor X was was wavering and he, he took Professor X out. <laughs> now he had a big guilty conscience about it, but I mean, Professor X had been asking for it for years, bro. And if there is a character that gets love that really probably shouldn't, it's Professor X because he is terrible. And um, even when you read the comic books, he's terrible. Um, and so as a leader, he's terrible. As a protector of mutant kind, he's terrible. As a mentor, he's terrible. Um, he's manipulative. He mind controlled Jean and tried to seduce her and mind controlled Scott and manipulated the X-Men and did all kinds of other seedy, dirty kind of things. And so I think the person that deserves the Cyclops hate is actually Professor X. He deserves the kind of hate that Cyclops is getting. Uh, disagree with me with you if you want. I'm cool with that. Um, I would love to have that interaction. But the person that should be getting the hate that Cyclops gets is Professor X. Because he is the one that sold the X-Men up the river. He's the one that sold the mutant population up the river. And even, I, again, if we're into spoilers... With the entire Hellfire Gala breaking down and the absolute massacre that happened there where Nimrod turned into 
freaking uh, Michael Myers in the last Halloween movie where he just killed everybody. <laughs> Bodied everybody. Um, Professor X is the one that sold the mutants out, bro. You can't convince me otherwise. Um, and he's feeling rightfully guilty for the stuff that he's done. Cyclops was trying to protect the mutants and trying to protect their interests. And he got caught up bad and his legs got broken and they sold his eyes shut and they really jacked dude up, but he ain't snitching on anybody. Meanwhile, professor X is having a big, whoa, whoa, whoa is me feeling sorry for himself kind of moment on the, what used to be the mutant Island of Krakoa. And that's where he's at. So he made the decision. He sold the mutants out. And then he's sitting around feeling sorry for himself. That's who's deserving the hate that Cyclops has been getting through the years. Challenge me on it. Argue with me on it. S Professor X has been the wishy-washy, ineffective leader that we portrayed Cyclops as. You know, and to be quite honest with you, when it comes to leadership, my favorite leader of the X-Men has always been kind of Storm because Storm had a balanced approach between the two philosophies where, you know, she was she was like, we're going to protect mutant life. We're going to try to protect human life to the best of our abilities. Um, so we might sacrifice ours, put ourselves on the line to protect humans. But if we can't do it. We can't do it. And Storm was the one that was the dynamic and powerful leader, too. Professor X was just kind of the armchair quarterback. Well, I'm not. Y'all ain't really in danger. You know, he never really put himself on the front lines. And he had had Storm and Cyclops out there leading those teams. So I'll argue with you about it. <laughs> I anticipate other arguments as I do these live streams because what I got coming up is um, I got a couple of. So let me go back to my notes and talk about what I actually have coming up over the next couple of weeks. Um, I want to break down. I want to talk about, I want to uh, do a deep dive into why, why Rodimus Prime sucks and talk about, <laughs> and talk about the Transformers, the animated, the OG Transformers animated movie, the OG Transformers movie, the one that came out in the eighties and was like hamburger heel for children. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, why Wolverine is way overused. And how overexposed he is. Um, we're going to talk about why Batman sucks. I wrote about it. <laughs> we're going to talk about it. Now, I've tried this video a couple of different times. Um, I finally put a script together. So we're going to talk about why Batman really does suck. We're going to talk about why Superman Returns was a really oddly entertaining movie. If you weren't really there for... If you like Superman movies with no action and just weirdness, Superman Returns was an amazing movie. <laughs> so we're going to talk about that. Um, and I got a couple other comic book things to go on to, but um, those are the things that we have next coming up. And, you know, I'm probably going to have a big conversation about why Jason Todd should have remained dead. And um, we're going to talk about... Um, WWE and how black folks are kind of still getting the short end of the stick, even though we got some representation as champions. They ain't really going all in with us. There's a lot of different things I want to discuss here, but this is hopefully the first in many um, times where I sit down and talk to you and just kind of share my unfiltered thoughts about comic books. And in Blurting While Dad, all of this is going to be mixed with parenting stuff. It's going to be mixed with social commentary and things like that. So um, there's going to be a lot of different things, a lot of different topics that I like to opine on. So that's what we're going to talk about. Ideally, I want to get into long form video essays about some of this stuff where my thoughts are a little bit more organized, but I need to get my chops up kind of improvising and then um, figure out a process that makes sense for me to do longer form video essays about some of these, stuff, some of these things. Um, also, if you're interested, um, I can talk about um, IDW transformers that run from like 20, I want to say 2003 to like 20. I don't know. 
maybe 2019, 2018, 2017, that run um, is probably one of the best runs in comic books. And I feel like people overlook that um, from character development and world building. This is how you do it. Um, and so we're probably going to talk about that. There's a lot of different things I got uh, in store and I want to have these conversations. So I'm excited for it. Again, I'm going to take this live stream and try to find the bullet points and chop it up into something a little bit more coherent. But the premise is Cyclops is Cyclops is misunderstood, and this is in defense of him. If you don't like it or you don't agree with me, go ahead and drop something in the comments. But I challenge you to go read um, some modern versions and tellings of him. And when I say modern, I'm talking about from the last 10 years, even to the last 15 years of character development of who Cyclops is. And it is he is not the same person that you see in the movies or that we're familiar with on X-Men, the animated series, just not, he's just a different dude. So that's what I got. I do appreciate your time. Uh, I'm probably going to do another recording here um, so that I can post exclusively to the interwebs. So it won't be a live stream, but appreciate your time. Thanks for dropping in. I will holler at y'all later. Peace.